there's an old saying, it takes two to tango. Now that's a phrase usually reserved for Argentinian dancing, or probably in an advertisement for orange flavoured soft drinks, but it can also be applied to video games, in particular, enemy design. Since the days of Space Invaders, enemies have served a single, simple purpose, to create a challenge for the player that they can overcome, and in doing so, have fun. But it's not quite that straightforward, is it? Simply challenging the player is easy, but challenging them in a compelling, interesting way? That is much harder. Engineering the perfect enemy requires mastering concepts that are really quite difficult to put into words, and I've spent ages trying to get my head around what separates an all-time great bad guy like Bioshock's Big Daddies, Mario's Goombas or Prey's Mimics from one that's merely… good. So what I've done is outline four fundamental characteristics I think most good enemies share as a way to figure out not only what that special secret enemy design ingredient is, but why particular favourite bad guys work so well, and why some just… don't. Let's get started with the first characteristic, and that is the idea of an appropriate difficulty. Note that I didn't say that good enemies have to be hard, because they don't. What is important is that enemies have a level of difficulty that reflects the kind of experience they're supposed to create. It's perfectly okay that these cultists you'll see running around in the early stages of dusk are easy to kill and don't do much damage, because at that point in the game most of the challenge is in developing the muscle memory and shooting skills you'll need to survive in any good 90s shooter, and so once the difficulty ramps up in chapters 2 and 3 these enemies will be phased out and replaced with harder and harder variants that feel fair because you've mastered the skills needed to take them on. Of course, easy enemies still have their place, even in sections of a game that are meant to be harder. They can be a great way to ramp up or cool down the level of tension, or to give players a few crucial feel-good power trips to stop the difficulty getting too oppressive. On the flip side, really tricky enemies way above the normal difficulty curve can be a great challenge for experienced players that recreates the thrill of a first time playthrough, as well as a way to give new players a nice grudge to pursue. Black Knights in Dark Souls, Hide Knights in Dark Souls 2, and a bunch of different enemies like these one-off demons in Dark Souls 3 are completely optional fights that guard rare treasure or quest objectives. Most first-timers will usually try these fights a few times, but get distracted by the comparatively easier foes on the critical path. But for players who want a challenge, these guys help to break up the monotony of playing through areas you've already mastered by sticking you with an additional challenge that's tough for even real-life MLG Dark Souls pro gamers like myself. That's not even mentioning how really hard enemies can be a great way to teach players a lesson. Risk of Rain's gradually advancing timer begins to spawn tougher and tougher baddies as time goes on, eventually going so far as to spawn packs of bosses as if they are enemies. Naturally, these are way too hard for someone who doesn't know what they're doing, and the looming threat of these big scary creatures keeps players pushing forwards into the next level where they can get better stuff, rather than encouraging them to waste time scouring every level for all its loot before moving on because that's a really boring way to play. Difficulty is by no means the only part of a good enemy though, because enemies need to oppose the player in a way that's actually interesting, and the best way to do that is to make them specific. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that a specific enemy is one that has a distinct identity, it has strengths, weaknesses and abilities that are unique and set it apart from everything else in the game. Take a look at the best chapter in Half-Life 2, We Don't Go to Ravenholm. This level, which is a zombie infested town, uses three different breeds of bad guy to provide the player with three different experiences. Regular zombies are easy to hit with stuff like saw blades, but they come in large numbers and can quickly overwhelm you if you get distracted. Fast zombies are much more aggressive and can panic you when you're in tight quarters, but don't actually do that much damage or have very much health. And poison zombies throw poison headcrabs, horrible little bastards that can make you very vulnerable by temporarily reducing your health to one, but they're slow and make a telltale clicking noise when they're preparing to strike. By really leaning into what makes these enemies special, they can be used to create fantastic memorable experiences like a rooftop duel against a horde of fasties, or a back alley infested with poison headcrabs that surprise you. These designs are much more interesting than just having three boring variations on the same template with slightly different stats. A lack of specificity, god I hate saying that word, is why Call of Duty's many flavours of dupe with gun are way less compelling than, say, Titanfall 2's selection, such as ticks that explode, robots that don't mind losing limbs, and shield guys you need to flank. In For the King, a fun little roguelike JRPG, each enemy has its own signature attack, like these rat thieves who can steal from you then run away, or these brilliantly goofy rock and roll skeletons who can cancel your moves by distracting you. Even these small, unique twists can help fights to feel memorable and fresh as you have to switch up your tactics in every fight to deal with these distinctive enemies and their distinctive weaknesses. Like the fact that the big boss bard skeleton, the Royal Droll, is really reliant on his backup band for buffs, 
and so is much weaker once they're dead. Specific enemies don't even have to be based around mechanics, they can even be based around getting the player to think or feel in a particular way. In Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, these fast moving teleporty boys are a real pain to deal with early on, and can leave you feeling paranoid and stressed as they menacingly circle around you, dodging your attacks and chipping away at your health. But as you get better at the game and can master the focus ability, you can stun them and take advantage of their low health, a triumph which reflects Senua's journey to try and master her psychosis. While specific enemies are great for giving players unique and varied experiences, that great design isn't going to mean anything if players don't know what kind of experience they should be having and how to engage with their foes. And how to do that? Well, you've got to give them a personality. Giving an enemy a personality is a little bit more than sticking a pair of googly eyes on something and calling it a day. Everything from the way an enemy looks to how it responds to a player's actions informs the way they feel about it and influences the way they'll engage with it in the future. Let's start with something that makes it easy to illustrate what I'm talking about, cowardly enemies. Peeps that are either scared of you, or run away when they spot you. These guys are a bit of a game design trope, and with good reason. Because your first instinct when seeing an enemy that wants to get away from you is to not give it that chance, prompting a little mini chase scene and immediately establishing a relationship between you and them. Because players naturally want to chase cowardly enemies, Giving them a big sack of loot or something shiny to grab is also a great way to further catch the player's eye and encourage this behaviour. We can see this in the form of these money bag enemies in Mario 64, as well as the baby crystal lizards in Dark Souls, who players naturally get trained to spot because of all the cool stuff they carry. The same is true for enemies who actually defend themselves. Before a player has ever even interacted with an enemy, all they know about it comes from their observation. Therefore, it's important to use an enemy's design to communicate what it does and how it acts as clearly as possible. Deadly long-ranged enemies like Guardians from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, or literally anything wielding a sniper rifle, usually have these big, dumb, nonsensical laser sights that totally give them away. Although this, admittedly, isn't very realistic, it subconsciously communicates to players that the fun in this encounter comes from staying out of sight and closing the distance without getting shot, but also because getting sniped out of nowhere isn't very much fun. When it comes to the visual design of enemies, exaggerating important features is usually the right way to go. If an enemy explodes, cover it with something like big inflating pustules, and if you don't want players to jump on something, cover it in spikes, which are universal game design shorthand. For aggressive foes that charge into battle, give them qualities that instill this idea in the player. For example, big bull's horns or a massive battering ram arm like the charges from Left 4 Dead. It's fine to keep stuff like how to actually beat a puzzle based enemy, or some cool niche interactions for players to discover, but people always need to know how to at least approach an enemy otherwise they're not going to know what to do and will miss out on all the cool design that went into them. Having enemies with a clear, focused design is a great foundation upon which to build an iconic bad guy, but it's not enough. A great enemy also needs to fit into the wider ecosystem of play, whether that's working alongside other enemies, the environment, or even a player. In other words, a good enemy is synergistic. Take Halo. A game with great specific enemies that all do a particular job and very clear visual design that's elevated to iconic status by the way all of its relatively simple enemies interact with each other to create a bunch of great emergent scenarios that continue to challenge players in new and inventive ways. The most obvious example is in the strange relationship between grunts, these little jerks, and elites, these big guys. Under normal circumstances, grunts will run away from you if you try and close the distance, because any melee attack will kill them instantly. However, if an elite is present, they won't. Instead, grunts will run right at you and get in your face where you're trying to deal with more important enemies. Of course, killing their elite boss will cause the pack of grunts to scatter like the little cowards they are until they find a new elite to team up with. This relatively simple set of rules and interactions creates a brilliant back and forth between the players and the enemies where interacting with them isn't just a one way relationship, but they'll actually respond to your actions, causing you to have to shift tactics even in the middle of an encounter. Most platformers as well are great at combining disparate elements together to create new interactions, like this great elevator level in Rayman Legends that combines sentries and these weird splinter cell frogs to make an awesome action movie fight scene, or how Mario Maker lets you stack enemies on top of each other to create Frankenstein hybrid bad guys. And before you go telling me that Frankenstein was the doctor, think about this, wasn't he and by extension humanity's fear of otherness the real monster? Yeah. I've read a book. Synergistic enemies don't always have to be working against you. A lot of the time, enemies can be used as tools. In Into the Breach, 
An intermediate player that's gotten to grips with how each of the individual Vex species works will figure out that often, these giant space bugs themselves are a more effective weapon than anything bolted onto your mechs, and learning how to get spitters that blast their friends, or a tunnelling Vec to kill the one above it, is an important and awesome part of the strategy that's really just an expansion and development on very basic information. A difficulty, Specificity, Personality, and Synergy. Four key qualities of good enemy design. But there's something else isn't there? It's all well and good taking notes on good design, but that's not very useful if we don't at least try and understand what links these different qualities together. And well, as you might have guessed already, that particular thing has been staring us in the face this whole time. A truly great enemy isn't designed around difficulty, or synergy, or anything else, but around the player. It's the relationships, both mechanical and emotional, we form with enemies that elevate them from being simply entertaining to being a core part of the experience. It's almost like a symbiosis. Enemies exist to continually reinforce the themes of the game onto the player, ensuring that their perceptions and interactions with the experience are framed in the right way. Let me show you what I mean with one of my favourite enemies ever, the Mimics from Prey. First, Difficulty, which gives the player a broad emotional context for the kind of experience they're supposed to have. Prey's Mimics are… pretty weak. Usually they can be killed in one or two hits from your wrench, but they're just tricky enough to be annoying, and their numbers mean that each one can chip away at your dwindling resources, making finally catching and smashing one of the little bastards a great moment of catharsis, but also a way of ratcheting up the tension because you know there are more just around the corner. A specific experience gives players something they can think about and work with consciously, affecting the kinds of choices they make. Praise mimics are, as you might have guessed, capable of mimicking any object in the game. This ability turns tension into full-blown paranoia, messing with your best laid plans as medkits jump out to attack you and you suddenly find yourself outnumbered as hidden mimics join the fray when you're fighting something bigger. This encourages players to act more cautiously, avoiding fights out of fear until they need to take big, interesting gambles to get precious resources that may turn out to be angry crab friends. A mimic's audio-visual design ensures that the experience they deliver is easy to engage with and makes conceptual sense, strengthening the player's suspension of disbelief. Mimics are low to the ground, indistinct, and capable of making some horrible alien chittering noises that give the impression of annoying vermin, but also taps into the hardwired fear humans have of stuff that looks like spiders. The masterful animation on these guys, where their body mass seems to constantly shift and warp, creating these cool glitch effects, makes their transformation ability seem natural, and gives paranoid players something to look out for when they suspect there's a mimic about. Lastly, Synergy, which helps to tie the experience these enemies create into the rest of the game making the whole package feel more cohesive. Mimics serve an interesting role in the Typhon ecosystem. They're not there to kill you, but to drain your ammo by dodging your attacks and sap your health by getting a few surprise hits in, thereby making you an easier target for the actually dangerous enemies. By draining your resources and keeping you on edge, Mimics make the rest of the game that much scarier and much more of a threat. In Prey Mooncrash, the DLC, Mimics can also lure the deadly vibration-sensitive Moonshark towards you by falling on the sand in object form. Without Mimics to reinforce what Prey is all about, it'd be more or less the same game, but it'll be much harder for players to engage with the game's unique and not particularly perfect blend of survival horror and immersive sim. Minecraft's creepers remind us that the world and everything in it is malleable and controllable, and Enter the Gungeon's Bulletkin help to reinforce the idea that the game is way more of a bullet hell shooter than it is a roguelike. Even in games that don't have enemies in the traditional sense, have mechanics and systems that fill the same role, like the verbal battles in Phoenix Wright, which test and undermine your knowledge of how you thought a murder played out. The relationship between player and enemy, and by extension player and designer, is a very complicated one, and something I've barely scratched the surface of here. But until I get around to revisiting this topic, remember to take a closer look at your favourite enemies in your favourite games, and take a moment to think about what kind of experience they're creating, and how that ties into the way you play the game as a whole whether that's tense sneaking around in Prey, an empowering sense of whimsy in Mario, or simply the white-hot, all-consuming rage I feel when playing Animal Crossing. But uh, that's a story for another time. Well hi there! I hope you enjoyed me dying over and over again to easy bad guys for footage, because you know that wouldn't have happened if I didn't need to record it! <laughs> anyway, 
Before I get to the bit where I thank my generous Patreon supporters, it's time for me to recommend a cool YouTube channel for you to watch, and this time it's Game Score Fanfare, a great channel all about video game music and how it all works. The channel's kinda like mine, but with higher production values and an actual topic, so that's good. Go check it out, link in the description. Right, time for me to thank the cool people that make this channel possible, my top tier Patreon supporters, who are Alex DeLotch, Asaran, Alno94, Baxter Heel, Brian Notariani, Calvin Han, Colin Herman, Chill, Daniel Metges, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Feetzalot, Jesse Ryan, Jonathan Christensen, Joshua Binswanger, Leech 2, Lucas Slack, Lunar Eagle 1996, Mace Window 54, Maduki, Patrick Romberg, Ray's Dad, Samuel Vanderplatz, Strateger in Ultima, Yaron Mirren, and Chow. Thank you very much to those people, thank you to all my other patrons, and an extra special thank you to you for watching. Isn't that sweet? Right, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!